well. Um, so hello, everyone. We're going to be starting in one second. So before we start, if you can uh, click on chat, please enter your name, your company. If you're in transition, let us know what field you are in. Um, you can also add what city you're from. Um, feel free to add anything you'd want from your LinkedIn profile if you want to connect with the rest of the community. Um, for those who are watching um, LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, live stream, we want you in the conversation as well, okay? Um, and so tell us where you're from um, in the comments. So you can tell us what city you're from, what state. We have people all over the world who join our calls um, because it's also important for you guys to really connect with each other as well. We're trying to really build the community where we really fully support each other. Um, and I'll try to check the comments as well. So comment on you know LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever live stream platform that you are on. So the focus on today's Let's Talk is on making the most out of your third act, 50 and beyond, though you don't have to be 50 to be on this call with Diane Gilman. And those for those new to Community of Seven, there's one singular purpose of these Let's Talk calls, and it's to create an environment where participants Participants can really help support each other during this global crisis and beyond. More than ever, we really need to come together as a community to support and uplift each other. So if you can turn up, uh, for those who are in the Zoom room, turn on your videos because we wanna see you uh, and your beautiful faces. For this next ta uh, activity, top right hand side, I want you to put yourself on gallery mode. So you should be able to kind of see each other kind of like the Brady Brunch uh, uh, grid. Um, so we always start our calls with a series of questions. If the answer is yes, I want you to raise both hands like this, okay? So how many of you on this call have ever caught yourself saying, I'm too old to fill in the blank? Raise your hand if you've ever said, I'm too old to. Doesn't matter what the, the end part is. How many of you feel that society has forgotten about those 40 and up? How about 50 and up? 60 and up? How many have felt discriminated against either in the workplace or finding venture capital as a startup due to ageism? How many feel that age is currently a limiting factor in their life? How many of you are feeling pessimistic about what the future holds? Last question, how many of you are excited about what the future holds? Thank you so much. So for the next part, I want you top right hand side, go into speaker mode. So you should just probably say me, hello. Um, so for those who answered yes to, I am excited about what the future holds. And even for those who won't, after this call, you are going to be so freaking excited about what the future holds. Because you know, I got on a call yesterday with Diane and I was I left so inspired. I was so excited, right? Because I was one of the, the folks who said, I'm too old because, right? And we have these limiting beliefs because of what people tell us, what society tells us. Um, you know, I used to, many of you guys know, I used to be the general manager of see her. And we had this, this phrase, if you can see her, you can be her. Here's the thing. You never see women past a certain age on TV, in magazines, right? So how does that kind of play into your self-esteem? And let me tell you, I am so freaking sick of those 30 under 30 lists right? Give me a 50 over 50 list any day. I'm inspired by those with, the bat with battle scars, those who have failed over and over again and have never quit. I'm inspired by dreamers who have bootstrapped their way to success. I'm inspired to, for those who are constantly striving to get better no matter what age they are. On the media, you are practically forgotten if you are women over 40. And this is just my guesstimate, but you know, men have that this issue too, but it's probably more closer to 60 where they're forgotten. You never hear about the founder who finally made it at age 40, 50, or 60, but you hear about the whiz kids 
who created his startup in his college bedroom. You hear about the female founder who IPO'd in her 30s. So despite the numerous stories of whiz kids, entrepreneurs like Zuckerberg on down, who started companies in their dorm rooms, research suggests that founders over 40 run more successful companies. In fact, the average age for business founders hovers around 40. According to research conducted by MIT professor Pierre Azule, who analyzed 2.7 million people who founded companies between 2007 and 2014, he found that founders at age 50, 50 is approximately twice as likely to experience a successful exit, meaning they get acquired or go public compared to founders at the age of 30. So while doing research for this microlearning, my mind was blown because there are so many successful stories of entrepreneurs and founders who started their companies and who created their personal brands at a later age, but you never hear their stories. You always hear about the young founders, right? So interesting story, renowned fashion designer Vera Wang didn't design her first dress until she was 40. Henry Ford was 45 when he created the revolutionary Model T car in 1908. Julia Child, the renowned sh uh, chef, didn't write her first cookbook till she was close to 50. Ray Kroc, um, the McDonald's magnet that we all know, was a traveling salesman selling milkshake mixers to drugstores at the age of 50 when he met Dick and McDonald, who owned a small self-service bur uh, burger joint and convinced them to franchise their business. By the age of 63, Ray Kroc had opened 400 restaurants in 44 states, 63. Writer Harry Bernstein authored countless rejected books before getting his first hit at the ripe age of 96. And one of my favorite all-time success stories Colonel Sanders, we all know Colonel Sanders. Harlan Sanders held number, a number of jobs before 50. He was a farmer, fireman, insurance salesman, and streetcar conductor. At 40, he began running a Kentucky gas service station where he also offered fried chicken to hungry patrons. By 1935, Sanders' recipe had become so regionally famous that Governor Ruby LaFoon honored him with an official Kentucky Colonel title. The Colonel franchised in 1952 at the age of 62. He was in his 70s when he sold his interest of KS KFCs for millions of dollars. So quick activity before I introduce the amazing Diane, which is going to be so awesome. Um, two questions I'm gonna ask you. I want you to do this in the chat. For those who are watching live stream on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, et cetera, I want you to do this in the chat as well. First question, right? type this in the chat, but don't press send until I tell you. In the chat, how many feel that your age has limited you, whether internally or externally? So for example, internally, I could just say, well, I'm too old to run a marathon. Externally, it could be, I'm never going to get that job at that agency because they don't hire anyone as a creative di director that's 30 and above. Type in the chat um, what you feel, if you feel age has limited you or not, and name one of the most pervasive. So for example, ageism in society, um, you know, physically, that's a limitation. So I'm going to let you type, and I'm going to count down five, four, three, two, one. One, press enter. Yes, no, I got a lot of yes. You are overqualified, ageism. Um, I'm getting a lot of yes. I feel age has, a, has limited me. Age has limited folks in um, the job, uh, uh, hunting for jobs. Age in my industry has been impacted. Um, I love Sharon. Yes, I still look young. You do, Sharon Harris. <laughs> um, and Kathy, I refuse to let uh, my age limit me. Um, and we get a lot of overqualified. 
I think that is probably the worst excuse ever when companies say that you're overqualified. What does that even mean? Don't you want someone who has the qualifications? It like makes no sense, right? Okay, so the next question that I have you have I uh, want you to kind of post in the comments. If age wasn't a factor, what do you dream of doing? If age wasn't a factor, what do you dream of doing? Type that in. I'm going to count down. What do you dream of doing? Running a marathon, traveling around the world, starting your own clothing empire, being on TV, writing a book. Dream big. Don't dream small. We've been taught to be small. Dream big. Type in the comments what your dream would be. Five, four, three, two, one. I have this one I'm excited about. So uh, let me see. Lots of travel, write a book. I love that. Lots of travel. Um, designing scarves. I like that one. Um, creating my own community like you. Will, you're already doing it. So you're already on your way. Managing teams remotely. Well, I think that's pretty easy to do right now. <laughs> Changing careers. Traveling the planet. I get a lot of traveling, sports marketing events, um, writing, um, finances, financial stability. Okay, I love that. Um, it's really interesting because we limit ourselves so much, right? And I'm looking at all of these different comments and I'm like, you totally can do that. And what's interesting is I know a lot of you guys who are on this call and I'm like, yes, of course, you could do it right now, but why do we wait? And I was talking to this researcher who studied um, senior, senior citizens who were kind of in homes. And he said one of the, the one, what it, well, you know, I asked him what was the biggest regret for a lot of these people who were kind of at the their end of their lives. And he said the number one, I guess, regret was not living my own life. Basically living what the world or my parents told me I should be. And for those on this call, and I think Diane is gonna be very inspirational in this matter. Um, don't wait, because tomorrow is not given, right? So thank you so much for everyone who kind of participated in that quick um, uh, poll. I am so excited to introduce today's guest, Diane Gilman. She's also known as the Jean Queen. Diane was born to design fashion from an early age. She picked up a crayon as a two-year-old and drew a polka dotted dress on a stick figure uh, and uh, dyed the cast. All through her early career and teens, her dream was to move to New York and hit it big in the fashion industry. She started her first fashion store in Los Angeles as a freshman at UCLA in the mid 60s called I'm a Hog for You Baby, after the supposed first rock and roll recording. This soon became a favorite destination among Hollywood starlets such as Anne Margaret and Cher. In the late 60s, Diane followed the music scene to San Francisco, handcrafting one-of-a-kind denim creations for the likes of Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, Grace Slick and Jefferson Airplane, uh, Jerry Garcia and the Grateful Dead, Jim Morrison and the Doors, and the list goes on. Diane moved closer to her childhood dreams of making it big in New York City in the mid-70s. Um, in the early 80s, she was discovered by Bloomingdale's to produce her first full collection. She was given a window at Bloomingdale. Um, she was credited as one of the first designer to introduce washable silk in the U.S., a coup which brought her broad fashion department store recognition, and millions of devoted followers. However, nothing could compare to the huge global recognition she has realized as one of the foundational fashion pioneers of teleretail. Diane has spent 27 years on HSN as a longest running fashion personality. Her fashions appear on HSN in the USA, the Shopping Channel in Canada, QVC in the UK, QVC in Italia, 
QVC in France and TVSN in Australia. So all the folks who are watching this globally, you probably recognize Diane. Her first book was published in 2013, titled Good Genes. Um, it's Diane's autobiography written um, and dedicated to the baby, baby boomer, boomer generation. Um, Diane owns all of her current success to one light bulb moment when she decided to create a very unique fit in denim based on catering to the baby boomer figure um, with close, you know, sexy yet comfortable jeans, innovative, innovative fabrications such as super stretch on down. And it became one of the most fastest selling hits on QVC and it earned her the title Jean Queen. Her incredible success has instilled with her gratitude and a heightened sense of purpose. She's currently involved with several charities, including UNICEF, HSN Care, St. Jude, Children's Research, Hospital, Diamond Unleashed, etc. Diane, if you can unmute. Wow, where do I begin? You've definitely had an entrepreneurial spirit at an early age. What sparked this all in you? Like, did you, you have know your background? I have to say that I came into an era where women did not work. And I actually had to run away from home and leave home for many years to pursue my dreams. So from the time I was two, two and a half, I, I honestly knew exactly what I wanted to do. I just didn't know how to get there. and. Designing for rock and roll stars, and that was really great in my 20s, but then I felt, you know, it was like that clock ticking, and I thought, oh, look at everybody around me, like Betsy Johnson, they're all famous, and I'm still designing for the Jefferson Airplane, what am I going to do? Well, I got on a plane, and I came to New York. Nobody would hire me. I had no design experience. I had no education in design. So I got a job as cocktail waitress in the evenings at Max's Kansas City and then met Andy Warhol and all those people. And in the day, I was in the old ladies foundation department selling bullet bras before Madonna made them famous because that was the only job that was available at the time when I applied and then met a uh, fashion coordinator at Bloomingdale's and showed her my little collection. I would go home in between the cocktail hour and Bloomingdale's closing and closing, and I was always designing. It was amazing to me that my greatest success came after I turned 60. I must be the oldest living fashion designer in the world at this point, but I had such a passion for it, and yet I always thought. I know I'm not hitting my stride and why? Because I wasn't designing from the heart. Although I loved fashion, I was always put in a situation with backers where I was designing what they wanted me to design. Then sometimes the, you know, the worst thing that can happen to you becomes the best thing that ever happened to you. So at a certain point, I lost my name in a legal battle, couldn't put any kind of label that had my name in a department store again. Whew. And just the, the legal battle was so expensive, just drained every penny I had ever saved. I swear, maybe five days before I was going to just declare bankruptcy, QVC called me. And I thought, honestly, at first, I thought it was a joke. I thought, and they said, do I be on TV? And I thought, who doesn't? <laughs> and I said, I can't do it for you because I can't use my name. And they said, guess what? You don't have to use your name. We'll just call you Diane. We'll tell everybody you're in every department store in America with washable silk. They'll know who you are. So it was not, oh, I want to be on QVC and HSN. It was simply to me what life is about. Life is a series of walls that come down and you're tapping against those walls constantly looking for the hidden door. 
the hidden spring door that's going to open and the light is going to shine through. So I found my very best friend on TV, which was a TV camera, never talked back to me, <laughs> just listened. And I got very serious about developing my television skills. I went to Juilliard School of Music, had an opera singer train my voice to be like 10 actives, octaves down. I had a really annoying New York shrill voice when I got excited. I, I did everything I could to make myself into the personality I really wanted to be 24 hours a day, but really just could be in a one hour show. And I hung in and I hung in and I hung in and way past the time when anybody would think a 60 year old woman would be relevant in the fashion industry in, in you know what was a niche. I became middle aged, I gained a ton of weight. I've been a rock and roll chick all my life. I couldn't wear jeans anymore. And I was grief stricken. I went to I took one year every weekend, Saturdays and Sundays, I went to a category killer denim store, tried on every jean and came to the conclusion, no one cared about me. But well, wait a minute, how could that be? We're the biggest generation on earth as baby boomers. And I thought, you know what? I care about me. And I created a jean. I, I got some denim. I had my sewing room make the first jean on my measurements, which were definitely middle-aged. And I remember walking down the street and I felt like the invisible woman for years. And two guys from Con Ed were working in a manhole cover and both of them popped up and whistled at me. And one of them screamed, hey, babe, you got it going. And I thought, <laughs> okay, <laughs> that just made my year. If that makes me feel that good, couldn't a gene make millions of women feel great about themselves? That was the light bulb moment. And 13 years later, 17 million genes later, I believed in myself. And for the first time in my life, and it's not that money matters, but it was definitely a, a signal for me, I became a millionaire. But to get there, I had to not only sell those jeans on air, I had to actually convince someone in the industry to back me. Because as my business partner said to me, you're out of your mind. Old fat chicks wearing jeans. Oh, no. And here's a guy with the giant beer belly. But it's not OK for women to be imperfect in age, right? So I always said buying a jean from me was an emotional, almost renaissance for a woman. And it was hope in a pant leg. And it was belief in yourself in a pant leg. And I built a community around me at HSN that I would have never dreamt of, almost 750,000 women who said, you know what? This gene changed my life. It gave me my sexy back. And so it was amazing to me at the age of 60 to have that light bulb moment, but also to understand my purpose. So after 27 years on air and many, many jeans inventions and top inventions, because I see myself more as a fashion inventor than even a designer. Um, I've just written my second book. Here's a manuscript, boy, it's heavy, called Wild Blue You. And I want to make my third act. I'm 76, just turned 76. Spectacular. My skills that I, that I got from being on air I want to use them to communicate and to honestly reshape people's minds about their lives. You know, I think that we are all put in a bucket past the age of 50 or 55 
where it's like, you don't count anymore. You're not relevant anymore. You're not creating anything new anymore. Um, but I'm going to ask everybody a question. When you go to a play on Broadway, do you leave after the second act? Do you not care about how it ends? Isn't the third act supposed to be the power of it all, the incredible ending, whether it's romantic or it's shocking or it's mysterious? So I have that in mind when I talk about third act. And I also have to say, where did our courage go? Because I don't hear from any. I, I hear from my customers because I'm so happy and fulfilled that they love my jeans. But I was a really adventurous young woman. And I was part of a huge movement in this country. And then somehow we all kind of drifted into our 30s and sort of became silent. I have a favorite saying. And my saying is, I'm not afraid of dying. I'm afraid of not living. And that really encapsulates my attitude towards however many privileged years I have left. I want to be brave again. I want to go into uncharted territory. And that's where I've been all my life. I was born in 1945. It was a sin to even, I mean, there was no such word as career woman. When I told my parents I wanted to, be in the fashion industry, they did everything they could to block me. No, you marry a Jewish doctor, you go to college to date doctors, pre-med school, right? And that's what you do. It was, my whole family was scandalized that I wanted a career. And so I feel like I've always kind of been in a jungle, hacking my way through it to try and get to the next village or the next step or the next posting. And I feel that way about where I'm at right now. Do you see yourself, people, in imagery anywhere except a drug commercial on TV? because they all anticipate that you're going to have something wrong with your body by the age of 45 or 50. Do you see any positive articles about you aging or how you should look? For instance, I had breast cancer uh, two and a half, three years ago. I came out of it, made a big decision because obviously I'm in front of a TV camera. How am I going to look? Who am I going to be? I set my image. I'm not going to dye my hair. Big shocker. I want to be the glamorous older woman. And I crafted it because I always see that image of me in that TV screen. But nobody showed me how. Even, even my super sophisticated New York hair salon has very little idea of how to handle white hair. We're just not, we are living so much longer. And if you're from a family like mine, where everybody lives to be 98 or 100, what do you do with the rest of your life? How do you remain visually vibrant? How do you convince people that you are still relevant? These are all the issues that are so important to me. And I'm looking for a way for us to get together and to band together and to be that voice and that force again. I love that. Um, <laughs> first, uh, can I, is it okay if I read some of these comments? Because oh, yes. I think they're just bringing me, giving me life. Um, uh, Bill Cook, it's amazing to see a whole uh, uh, screen of people who are 40, too many Zooms filled with younger people. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of your hair looks fantastic and amazing. Um, Bernadette Beekman, I will share your quote with my end of life clients, being a death doula is something I got certified for. So your quotes, your impact are already kind of making uh, a statement. Uh, Bernadette, again, I also stay at the end of the credits in movies. <laughs> <laughs> and Jamie LaPena, I want her energy when I grow up. <laughs> so I want to kind of... Um, go back because we had this conversation and not everyone just so that 
you don't think that Diane just kind of came from a world of kind of privilege. I, I had oh, a conversation no, no, no. with her about this. And um, there's a quote um, that uh, Rumi wrote and David Hansen had posted on LinkedIn. And it's one of my favorite quotes. Your, your wound is a place where the light comes in. And I think about that when you, with you, because you had a, a pretty, I would say traumatic or a, a rough kind of upbringing. Yeah. Kind of tell how that influenced you and that kind of helped make you grow. You know, I, I always think about what, because my life as a child was so much like a split screen. So, okay. So I remember I was six years old. And we got a TV and we were the second people on the block to get a TV and there were almost no TV programs. But as it grew into the 50s, you had Leave it to Beaver, My Favorite Uncle, then it was the Brady Bunch. So here I was in an abusive household and a household where literally anything I wanted, the answer was no and you were punished for it and a lot of physicality, a lot of violence. And then you're watching, like, leave it to Beaver and thinking, really? People have this kind of life? I mean, my life was more like, like you know, the Munsters or something. It was a very dark kind of household in the midst of, we looked so upper middle class on the outside, but it was just so difficult. Um, and I give one great uh, analogy that was just was very heartbreaking for me. Uh, when my father passed away, I finally went back home. I ran away from home as a teenager and made my own way in life. And my mother mentioned to my life partner, Jim, that I had gotten a four-year scholarship to the Sorbonne because I excelled in languages and that they burnt it up because they didn't want me to have a career and leave. They wanted me to just do what I was gonna do. So bottom line was even as a two-year-old or a three-year-old, I was always defending myself and fighting for what felt right to me, even as a little, little kid. And I, so I think it was natural that those developed skills, which don't always help you out socially, helped me out with a career I knew I had to have. If you are someone out there um, who was like me from the time I was a child, an infant almost, I knew exactly what I was supposed to be. I just didn't know how to get there because I had no support. And I finally had to leave home and create my own family to get that support. But designing for me, and still is, it's like a surfer riding the perfect wave. It's like taking air in and breathing it out. It is something I have to do. And from that, and this horrible lawsuit where I lost my name at the gun back again, I understood I was also a communicator. I was always terrified in my own showroom of having Bloomingdale's or Saks or Neiman Marcus walk in. I didn't want to show them my collection. I was scared to death of them. I was sure they were going to say, oh, bye. I was always geared for rejection. But then, when I got that chance to be on TV, I thought, now, wait a minute. I, I like this. Yeah, you can't see the people you're selling to. So I became very free within myself. And then there was a talent coach on HSN, Andy Sheldon, who is such a great guy. And one day I was very annoyed with one of the hosts on air, and I guess I showed it. And they pulled me off there the minute that show was over. And he said, now you listen to me. He said, do you want to be the biggest star on tele-retail? Then you have to know. Here's what you need to convey. 
every minute of your life is the best minute of your life spent with your audience. This is the best day of your life doing this show across TV and you love it. And you know what? He was right. And I started to understand gratitude. And I started to understand that the medium was so much bigger even than the message. And if you're on TV, you must be privileged and you must be glamorous and you must be this giant personality. And I came into my own when most women and most men too, at the age of 60, are struggling with who am I now? And then, uh, can you, can, you talk more, can you talk more about that? Because I think it is huge. We, especially women, and I would say older men, are taught to kind of be small. We're not oh, taught yeah. to be kind of big and no, glorious, big right? Big, How did you get there? Well, How did you get there? Here's the interesting thing. You can look at it two ways. Because I was always on the periphery of the rock and roll music industry and knew all the greats. And do you want, if you are going to be a success in your 20s or your 30s, chances are you're going to fade by your 50s unless you've got some incredible thing going for you. But I found it a gigantic advantage to being a, like a rocket ship to success at the age of 60. And there was a privilege within that, that if you had to choose the beginning of your career or the first two acts and the, towards the end of your career, it was far more powerful to be powerful at the end uh, in that time slot. I know so many people who just fizzed out. So I saw an incredible advantage. And the other advantage I saw was that nobody saw fashion and how valuable my generation was, except me. Is unbelievable, and it's still almost that way. And I always think to myself, even mathematically, if 10,000 people in America turn 50 every day, why is nobody but drug companies paying attention to us? Why don't we have meal kits just for us to help us burn calories? Why don't we have hair products just for us, clothing just for us? So I not only understood my niche, but when I became who I am, I understood the needs of my whole sisterhood around me. That's that I, I can only tell you that everything I do now is part of my belief system and from the heart. And if there is a way that you want to create your third act. And I don't care whether you make the best chocolate chip cookie in your village and you want to start catering or you just want to go help people or like me, you want to write books and, and, and be part of solutions for your generation. You do it from your heart, you will never lose. That is the key. And it took me till I was 60 to actually design an article of clothing that I loved so much that from the day I designed that jean, and I still have that jean in a little shrine and part of my closet, I have never worn anything but my brand, ever, day or night. I found exactly where I needed to be. And a million times before that, I was like, I'm going to quit. And oh my God, I'm 60 years old. Nobody wants a 60 year old designer. And then guess what? With the right idea, everybody wanted a 60 year old designer. And I became, after the age of 60, I became everything I ever wanted to be and, and was able to achieve so much that I always knew I had in me, but just couldn't get to. So, you know, there comes a time in life where maybe you've been in a corporate life for what feels like forever, 
I think this is going to be, and I think COVID is part of it. This is going to be a great age for small entrepreneurs, but it's got to be a passion project. It's got to be something that makes your heart beat fast and that you just wake up every morning and you're so excited about. I love that. I'm going to ask your, uh, another question that kind of touches upon that. But before that, I want to kind of read some of the comments. Joe um, Cresswell, I feel like I am only seeing and embracing my amazing powers at the age of 49. Uh, love that. Uh, yeah. By Geneva Asensio. Diane, are you on social media? Would love to follow and get more of this inspiration. So I'm going to post some of your pages on, on the you. comments at the end. Um, and I love uh, Bridget as well, adopting a service uh, attitude of service. And Lisa, thank you for your energy and excitement. And we also have a lot of folks who are kind of on LinkedIn Live right now, just kind of talking about their dreams and how you've also inspired them. Um, so thank you for that. So the follow-up question I had that kind of relates to that is this, what one piece of advice, if you could have picked just one, because you're kind of naming a lot of amazing tidbits, but what's the most important advice that you've received along the way that's helped you in your career? and life journey? What stuck with you? What one kind of piece of advice? And it could be more, you know, if you'd like as well. I think it's follow, believe in yourself. There were so many times when people wanted to knock me down. There were so many, I would say the majority of people never saw things my way. And it was just like, are you crazy? I, I remember in my 40s, getting a, a ton of marriage proposals, my late 30s into my early 40s. And one guy who was very famous in the garment industry and was the CEO of a giant department store and wanted to marry me, they all wanted me to quit. And he actually said to me, aren't you gonna give up like this, this little silly, dream you have he said i'll tell you what i'll pay for your psychiatry so that you get rid of this because it's just a hobby diane you are never going to make it you're already 42 years old and i thought oh that is so wrong and you know i gave up a life of leisure and i gave up i gave up a lot to do what I did, but I never saw it as sacrificing. I always saw it as building blocks. And my piece of advice is don't kill your dream and don't step on your destiny. If someone had said to me at the very beginning, okay, listen, go take a vacation till you're about 58 years old and then get on it because you're not ever going to really accomplish big dreams until you're 60. Yeah, maybe I would have done that, but nobody was there to say that. I had to believe in myself every step of the way. And if you think you've got something to contribute and it could be the best chocolate chip cookie in the world, it could be anything, it, it, then pursue it. What have you got to lose? And I always say, you can't be, you can't win it if you're not in it. So many times I wanted to quit before I was 60 and thought you just, you're not good enough or you're not resonating or you're not getting, I know you're talented, Diane, but you're not getting inside and really grabbing that talent. And then, you know, I went into an age of design and fashion in the industry where everything was about runway and the shenanigans of, you know, overliving your life, the big life of the designer, so extravagant, party time all the time. And then I just came out with a little humble jean that fit a middle-aged woman's body and the world opened up for me. So if you've got an idea, if you've got something that rattles around inside of you and never really leaves you, open up, embrace it, start putting it together, figure it out. You know, I've got 
two or three different platforms going that I'm really fascinated in with my third act. And I'm going to pursue all of them. I have everything. Okay, to get. So tell us about your third act, because I, I am dying to hear this and the folks here like what it's you've already done such amazing stuff. What's in your third act? What do you pick? Can, and how can this community help you? I, I want to leave my generation and I, I will be perfectly honest with everybody. I know how I, I'm very, very comfortable and love public speaking. I love my whole community of people that maybe started 50 or my age and we're all going through the same experiences and the same walls going up and the same lack of acceptance. I'm not sure how to get there. I'm someone who does not totally live in the present. I live in the future and I build stepping stones. So I love my book. I am so proud of my second book. It is such a beautiful, passionate read. Wow, We're going to have you come back when that <laughs> releases. Right. So that's, that's already a given. And so, but, so that well, well, is part well, of it. In 2013, you had your first, first book published, Good Genes, yeah. uh, which is an autobiography written and dedicated to the, the baby boomer generation. In this book, you discuss 10 secrets to aging agelessly. Yeah. Can you share some of the tips for the, for the folks who are on this call? Well, you know, the first thing is obviously if you're in television and you, you learn a lot of this from your makeup artists, but it's just little stuff you guys would never think of, but it makes a big difference. Like I always put foundation and self-tanner on my hands and it hides all the veins so it doesn't look like old lady. I do the same thing for my chest. I'll always put on foundation. Um, it's about health from within. That's a big deal to me. You know, I'm not opposed to plastic surgery. I don't like pain, so I don't do much of it. But my God, we probably take better care of our cars than we take care of our bodies and ourselves. Um, and the other thing is just create your own little Zen island. I cannot expect to feel like a 30 year old anymore. I've got a 76 year old body. I went through chemotherapy. It, it definitely left its toll, but you know what? I would say my bottom line is, and I'm gonna talk about cancer for a minute, the big C word, you, can never anticipate what you are going to get out of an experience. So my life partner died of cancer. I was the sole caregiver. It just ripped me up. It was seven years of just sadness and, and hell and took me a long time to recover emotionally and spiritually. And then I get diagnosed with stage three breast cancer. Uh, and I never blame, I, you know, I, I don't, bother to go around assigning blame but I did take hormone therapy way too long and those were the results so when I got cancer the first thing I hear is if you don't have a family around you that supports you you're not going to survive people that survive have families I have no family I have teeniest family in history but what I came to recognize was all my sisters on HSN were my family. And when I announced it on air, which wasn't easy, 130,000 women in a day and a half on Facebook wished me well, posted. So I felt like this little baby just being held and cradled. And I made a vow to myself. And I said, you know what? No one likes a cranky, old, bitter lady. I was 72, 72 and a half when I had to go into chemo. I said, I'm going to be the shining light for these nurses. I am going to have a good day every day. I'm going to make them want to be working on the day I come in for chemo because I'm always going to be the one who never complains, wants to tell them a funny story, is okay with not finding a vein, whatever it was. And I'm going to be the person to uplift all the women sitting in the waiting room. 
who are sitting there crying or, and my attitude was, this is who I'm gonna be and this is who I am going to become. Cancer is the great revealer. Cancer is the great onion peeler that takes away the whole outside and leaves the core. And I'm gonna become a better person because of cancer. And so I took a totally negative situation and made it into a shining orb. I love That's that. me in a nutshell. So I wanna actually, I know people are dying to ask you some questions. So sure. I kind of I want to, it. if you have a question, can you kind of let me know in the comments? Um, you know, so put it in the comments. Uh, if you have a question and for those who are on live stream as well, you can also ask your question on live stream. Um, just let me know if you have a question on, uh, if not, I will ask, uh, anyone. Okay. Well, Kathy asked, where can we follow you? Right. Um, and I will Facebook, oh. Facebook, and I'm going to create my own page now for my wild blue you. Um, and Instagram, um, and now LinkedIn, and of course on HSN. But I'm just getting the book to the publisher, and then I want to start a whole community of messaging out parts of the book and getting reactions back. And seeing, truthfully, I've always designed this way because tele retail television they can call in and say i love it or i hate it i mean you really find out instantly whether what you were doing was spot on or not i want to be able to do that with my message and the book i'm always someone who has listened rather than putting myself in an ivory tower and saying oh i'm a designer do what i tell you to do it's always what do you guys really want okay great let's create it so that's going to kind of be my mode going forward. So I'm working on my whole social media thing. I love that. And Christy also wants to let you know that she only wears your brand and she oh, loves your you. book, <laughs> Christy thank Braun. You so You'll love the second book even more. It's and we have a lot of people that want to support your book um, oh, thank you. and whatnot. Thank um, you. So folks, I'm going to ask questions unless you have any. Oh, Will. Do you want to unmute yourself? Good old Will. Yes. Um, just quickly. Thanks, Lance. <laughs> hey, Diane. Um, I put it in the chat, but I have to say this out loud. And um, Diane, you can roll your eyes because you've heard me say this often. It's um, your story and you speak about your generation and doing it for your sisterhood. But there are many men and other generations who find you inspirational. So wow, I just am you. putting that plug out there for I everybody think, listening. Yeah, you know, I think because I've had a female product for so long, forever, that I always, but I also am going to put this out there. I think it's a little bit easier, easier for men to age than for women. So I've always been a little more sympathetic <laughs> women, right? <laughs> Have to be honest about that one. Exactly. I mean, that is kind of interesting, kind of like the double standards between men and men and women. But I, I feel like things are also kind of changing uh -huh. where men are. And we have, we spoke about this yesterday, Diane, is that men are kind of feeling it, especially in the workforce, when you're talking about technology companies or you're talking, oh, about, yeah. you know, all of these different companies, people are getting aged out um, even at 40 when you talk about technology and, companies. Isn't that, that so to me? That is so wrong. And, you know, honestly, if I hadn't been on television, teleretail, which is an older customer and a customer that likes community and wants to age with you, because so, much, so many of us who are contributors with our own original brand, like Adrian Arpel, you know, we're inching our way up there. And so we really were lucky to get into a niche business that respected age. And actually my gene is get, that got to depend on our product because we offered something no one else was interested in pursuing. Yes. So I, I would honestly tell you for, for anybody who's thinking, God, the corporate world is merciless. And I've always had 
a fascination with something you do, some product, something that's small, small can get large so quickly if it's just the right spark. Yeah. And I want to, Laura Lay Thomas, do you guys, do you want to unmute and ask your question or do you want me to ask it? Do you want to unmute and ask, or I can ask it? Okay. So Laura Lay's question is, um, what is the one thing that you can share with us about changing your career, pivoting or workforce for focus? Do something, just what fascinates you? Like, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I come from a generation where marijuana is like the, you know, no fault recreational sport of the baby boomer. And the minute I heard that grass was legalized in New York, first thing I thought was, oh my God, I wanna open like the most beautiful, the most amazing, the cutest pot bakery. <laughs> you really want to know the truth? That would be one something I would love to do and make it beautiful, like a Parisian bakery, and have all kinds of wonderful decorated cakes and cupcakes in it and make people happy. You know, these are thoughts that go through my mind, and then I start to pursue them and see if they're you, possible. You know what? What I love about you, Diane, is that you don't even, you don't just talk about it. You actually act. Because the thing is, a lot of people have great ideas, but they yeah. never go the next step, which is to make them reality. And what I love about you is even since you were a little girl of two with that polka dot dotted drawing, yeah. you actually acted to make it happen. So Lisa Gates, you have a question. Do you want to unmute and ask a question? Sure. Hi, Diane. Thank you so Hi. much. And Leanne, thank you so much. So the question is, is how did you get others to notice you when you rebranded yourself, when you rolled out your new gene product line? Cause you had to position yourself as the expert. How do you, how did that I, happen? Uh, here's, here's how it happened. I never gave up. So I was at HSN and you know, life is going on and I'm doing washable silks and I'm not wearing them. They weren't my thing, but I did as good a job as I could. And um, I always had this idea in my brain about doing a jean because, you know, I dress so many rock and roll stars in my jeans and, and their jeans, and their, my creations. And I just never gave, gave up. I knocked on every door and it always got given to somebody else. They, they would take a brand that had nothing to do with the customer and then take maybe a fading soap opera star who was a size quadruple zero. And then it was like, oh, see, jeans won't work on TV. Nobody's buying these jeans. And I kept saying, you, you've got, you're, you're vectored incorrectly. And so finally, they, the executives just got so tired of hearing me. They said, okay, okay, okay we'll give you an hour. So make some jeans. So I made 5,000 jeans. I did a collection around it. Of course, it got stuck in the Panama Canal or something and all we got were the jeans. They gave me 5 a.m. on a freezing February morning. Like who's gonna be up at 5 a.m. on a Sunday morning? And guess what? All 5,000 jeans sold out in three minutes. And I thought, okay, I think we got something here. You want to be noticed? Make yourself noticed. You really believe in what you're putting out there? Just keep on believing it and you will find the door in the brick wall of life and open it up and the light will come shining through. I'm not kidding. I have done it a million times in my life. So last question, Kevin, if you want to unmute and ask your question. Make sure you unmute too. Hi, Diane. How are you? Hi. Hi, good. Um, I am like totally blown away by your, by everything that you shared. And oh, thank you. Um, I'm just here thinking about all these different things, all the, all the things that you shared. And the question I want to ask is, it, it seems like nowadays that the idea of failure 
has been embraced more than ever. Oh, yeah. My question to you is, whenever you encountered failure, what what are the secrets that that you use to keep yourself motivated to go higher and higher? Well, I would say, first of all, for a personality like mine, failure is unacceptable. So I remember when this talent, the head of talent on TV pulled me off air that day and said, you were a total bitch on air. Like customers hate that. They want you to be happy. And I'm crying. There's tears streaming down my eyes. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm such an idiot. I'm such a failure. And then what do you do? You pick yourself up. You dust yourself off. If you're lucky enough to have people around you that are honest to you, filter that advice and make it happen in a better way going forward. I never showed my anger on TV again. I realized that was going to be a road to failure. If you love what you do or you're streaming towards something that you're going to love to do or, or, you know, opening up a business, whatever it is, just know that failure is simply a way to reposition yourself more successfully. That's all it is. It, it only you can put yourself in a box and say, I can't get out. Only you. That's why I, it's funny. I always like to watch these, um, these things on Lifetime TV, like the girl in the box or the girl in the basement who gets trapped and, you know, by some maniac and stays in the basement for 10 years, but they all eventually get out. So I felt many times in my life that I was trapped by failure, that I wasn't succeeding at the rate I should have because I knew how much talent I had, but I couldn't get to it. Your life is a complete work in progress. So don't ever see a, a, a dip in what you're doing or contributing as a total failure. Just see it as a reminder from the universe that you're not doing something to your full capacity and be, I would say one of the great keys to success is don't necessarily listen to all the outside noise but be honest to yourself. Be honest to yourself. That's what I would say. Love that. Thank we you. are unfortunately out of time, but if you read the comments, I'm going to send you, Diane, the comments because you okay. have inspired so many people. Thank For those you. on uh, in the Zoom room, in the live audience, I want you to put gallery mode right now, gallery mode, and turn on your videos and unmute yourself right now. Unmute yourself, turn on your video because Diane deserves a round of applause. <laughs> unmute yourself, turn your video on, come on. Woo! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Diane, awesome. Great job, thank you, Diane. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. Thank Diane. you, Diane. You are yes. so you. amazing. Ready to go. For listening. <laughs> Great job. <laughs> Great job. Great job. Take care, everyone. All my friends. Very Thank good you, job. everyone. Thanks, Diane. You are. Up to Land for putting this together. Awesome job. Yeah, Clap for hand. Land. And, and Diane. Thank you, Land. And Diane. Thank you. Thank and thank you, Will thank you. Sullivan, for making this happen and making Yay. this happen. Thank you, Will. Thank, thank you, Will. Will. Yay. Diane, so, everybody. We're bringing so, Diane back when her her next book comes. We are all of us are going to buy it and pre order yeah, it. You. So we'll, be it. on the lookout. Be on the lookout <laughs> thank for you. that. Okay. Thanks so much, Bye. everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.